I want to start off with a quote that I'm sure you've heard before, uh, although the author is unknown. And, and it says this, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. How many have heard that before? Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Right? We've, we've probably all heard that. Now, this is very interesting. That quote is written by we don't know. It's unknown. And you're like, who, who did it? Uh, it's, it's unknown. Uh, you can search for it, but show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And we understand the importance of that. Now, many of you know, I have an eight-year-old, I have a six-year-old. And so we're constantly talking to them about the importance of their friendship and how it influences their lives. And there could be that tension in us this morning to say, um, this would work in Blaze Kids, but what about adults? Like, I've already, I've got my friend circle or I don't have my friend circle. And today, as we finish up this series, Loves, I really want us to understand there is an importance to the friends that you and I have. Some of you, no, they, they don't make a difference at all in my life, Pastor Keith. Come on, we understand there really is an importance to the friends that we have in our lives. And so today we're gonna explore the power and the importance of friendship. Throughout this series, we have been looking at some Greek words, and hopefully you and I are more versed in our Greek vocabulary at the end of this series. Uh, and the first week we discovered the word storge, right? Remember storge, and it was a family love. And then we looked at agape, which is a love that serves. Last week we looked at eros, which is a, a romantic or sexual love. And today we are gonna end with a friendship love, which is philia. Everyone say philia. Now, you and I know this word, Philadelphia, the, the city of what? Does anyone know? Brotherly love. And, and what's really cool about that, this is a fun Snapple cap fact for your life to impress other people. Philadelphia is simply a transliterated word, which means it's actually a word in Greek that we just brought over, kind of like how baptism is. It's just the word baptizo. So use that at parties and seem like you're smarter than the people around you if you want. Did you know Philadelphia is Greek? Um, but it really does mean brotherly love or affection, philos being the root word for friendship. So today, I believe it's important for us to understand that brotherly affection, that love for one another as friends actually matters. And I want to show you three things this morning when it comes to friendship. I want to show us how we all have the desire for friendships. I want to show us the cost of friendship. And I want to show us the result of having friends. So say with me, desire, desire. Cost, cost, and result. We're going to look at this, the desire, the cost, and the result. And in just a moment, we will be in Luke, and we'll see a, a person who needed friendships desperately. But before we read from Scripture in Luke 19, I want to read to you the opening line of Sally Lloyd-Jones' The Jesus Storybook Bible and how she paraphrases this beautiful story between Jesus and this person who is in desperate need of a friend. Here's how she starts it in a kid's Bible and I think it will really impact our hearts as adults. She writes this. There was once a man who didn't have any friends, none. Do you have any friends? It's a deep question. Maybe, maybe it's lost on children, so I figured I'd bring it out to adults. Because when I read this to my daughter, especially my six-year-old, and, and I get to this line, I always pause because I know she wants to interrupt the story desperately with, Daddy, of course I have friends. Harper's my friend. <laughs> and that Harper's their, their child. They are best friends. And, and she knows, like, she answers that so innocently and as a six-year-old and can sit there and say, of course I have friends. So how about you? How about me? I read this article by, uh, in the Huffington Post, and the article says this, making friends, well, really good friends, in today's day and age, is one of the hardest things to do. Because somebody give me a witness or an amen. amen. I mean, we live in a society where, sure, I've got thousands and hundreds of friends on social media, and we can live under this facade of friendship. But if we poke deep enough, if we peel back enough layers and really ask the question, in all of that, in all of what we call friends, 
Why is it we can still feel like nobody knows us? That I can't be vulnerable with anyone. That I can't share my story without feeling judged. Uh, That no one seems to understand who I am really at the core, like my soul, who I am. So we have a bit of a problem. As we'll see in scripture, you and I are designed for friendship. We're designed for community. I mean, you just heard Nina's story. Wasn't it laced in friendship? I mean, what, what was it that glued her to, to church and Jesus? It was, it was friendship. It was, it was people in her life. So we, we have what we're saying first, this desire, but there's a problem making real friends is hard. And I thought about this, just asking the question, why? Why is it so challenging, especially for us as adults, to make friends? And I thought maybe, maybe it's because you and I have been influenced by leading voices today like the leading voice of Queen Elsa. (laughs) Queen Elsa who says what? Don't let them in. Don't let them see. Be the good girl. You always have to be concealed. Don't feel. Don't let them know. (laughs) Give it up for yourselves. I mean, way to go. But think, I mean, this is a song that's on our lips. We, We sing it. We know it. But what is the theme of that? Conceal. Don't, don't reveal who you really are. Don't let anyone in. Stay guarded. And I want you to think in your own life. How many people truly know you? And where are you when it comes to being a true friend today because of your past and your experiences? And I'm sure that this room is filled with hurts and pains and betrayals and people that you've let into your life at some point and they weren't who they said they'd be. And it's marked you. And we we learn from our experiences and maybe, maybe it jades us a little bit. It makes us a little slower to trust, a little more cynical, a little more critical of people. And today we kind of have a choice. We can stay there and stay guarded and believe thoughts that come in that say this. Anyone ever thought this before? Well, I don't need anybody anyway. Or I'm never trusting again. Or I'm better off on my own. And today, I don't believe in our short time together that all of the wounds of the past are suddenly going to be made better but I do believe today can be a step towards healing. Yeah. Maybe, maybe there's some wounds that are still open, and if you would come to the Father, they could start to become scars. You know, a scar, it reminds us of the injury of the past, but it's closed up. It doesn't need tending anymore. It doesn't need wound care. You can grow from it. So, we're going to talk about friendships and the desire for the cost of and the result of having friends. So let's meet the man who had no friends, as Sally Lloyd-Jones writes. Luke chapter 19, verse 1 and 2. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. Say Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. So some observations that we should make in the text, because uh, we're kind of 2,000 years removed from this time. So first, Jericho. We're not talking about Jericho Turnpike on the island. Let's just establish ourselves here. Uh, This is a very wealthy, strategically located city. Uh, The duties and taxes were actually higher in Jericho because of its location. There was a lot of wealthy people that lived at Jericho. And if you were passing through with goods, you would inevitably be taxed, duties and taxes, but it was much higher because of its strategic location. So just, again, fun facts. They, they matter somewhat because who are we meeting? Zacchaeus. And what is the description we get of Zacchaeus? He is what? A chief what? Tax collector. And he was wealthy. Now, again, for our understanding, because we are in tax season, public service announcement, file your taxes. Tax day is coming. Um, when we think tax collector, maybe there's some angst that you personally have against the taxes in the government. I assure you, the angst is not as great as the Jews at this time against the Romans. It's just the reality. They would look at tax collectors and specifically Jewish tax collectors, and they were labeled traitors, thieves. 
They were degenerates. They were not accepted among society. They were rejected from the temple. They could not make sacrifice. In fact, if you've read scripture before, do you notice this? Oftentimes there is an isolation of tax collectors in the groups Jesus communed with. What does it say? He would often eat with sinners and they were so bad, they didn't even make the sinner category. <laughs> they get their own dishonorable mention. <laughs> But yeah, he ate with sinners, but also that's okay. He ate with tax collectors. And the room would have gasped and been in awe at that because sharing a meal and having community, again, was, we'll see, way different in this day. It wasn't simply just, hey, do you want to come over for the football game? It was an affirmation. The people you ate with matter to your reputation. Wow. So we meet here a chief tax collector and he's wealthy, but I would suggest this about Zacchaeus, just knowing history. And as we'll see, as the story unfolds, he may be wealthy in money, but he's incredibly poor in friendship. He may be wealthy when it comes to the money he has, but he's very poor in friends, in community, in people who know him. He, he's not getting text messages throughout the week. Hey, hey, Zach, how can I pray for you, bro? He's not getting that. Hey, man, it's men's night. You coming? He, he's not in those circles. There is not community for him. He is isolated and rejected by society. So we meet Zacchaeus, and let's see what he does because... Despite all that, Zacchaeus, like you and I, have a desire for friendship. So we read in verse 3, He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. We get another descriptor of Zacchaeus. And if you grew up in felt board Sunday school, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. I mean, this is just my childhood. I love this story so much. He has a desire to see Jesus. And as we read the text, it's interesting. It really is. Think about it. Luke's, Luke references his height. It's very interesting. We'll explore that in a moment. But he wants to see who Jesus was. Why does he want to see who Jesus is? Well, he has a desire for friendship. He has the desire that you and I have. Do you know that when God created the world, he says of everything, it is good, it is, it is good, it is good, and then he gets to man being alone in isolation with no community and says, it is not good that man is alone. Yeah. It's not good. Right. It is built in you as an image bearer of a triune God says in Genesis that God made man in our image, he says. So God is relational and you and I are created for relationship. It's built into you. It's why the desire for friendship exists. And Zacchaeus desires to just see Jesus. The Greek word there is zeteo, which means seeking, searching, desiring. And I thought, why does Zacchaeus desire so much to see Jesus? And this is my thoughts. Maybe he's thinking, well, what if Jesus doesn't reject me? Everyone else has. Will Jesus do the same? I've heard of a man who has meals with sinners and tax collectors. Maybe there's hope for me. It's just thoughts that he, he's a human. Because what he does is pretty humiliating in this next statement. We, we read that he is a, a short man, but think, and this is, this is just my own in, interjection, my own opinions here, okay? This isn't in the text. I believe that it's maybe implied, not explicit. If you're shorter, hey, where are we at? Here I am, okay? That's why I sit in the front row, by the way. I can't see past some of you, okay? If you're shorter, but you're trying to see something, and people are kind to you, even strangers, wouldn't they move out of the way naturally if you're trying to observe something? Has anyone ever been to a concert before, in a crowded space before? And if you have friends there, they're inevitably going to step aside like, yo, bro, we know you're a little, you're height challenge. All good. Come on up. We'll give you the front. We'll stand behind. Like normal people who accept other people would kindly move out of the way. Another thing that shows us Zacchaeus was not accepted by the crowds in this city. They know him. He's stolen from them. 
He's collected taxes. He's aligned himself with Rome. He is a traitor to the Jewish people. And we don't care if you can't see Jesus, you're not getting through here. So Zacchaeus, driven by the desire for friendship, does this. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. And you and I might read this and say, man, little man's got jumps. Look at this guy. He's so athletic. He climbs up a tree. How cool. No, you don't see an adult running in this culture, and you certainly don't see them climbing trees. Children, yes. Adults, no. So what is Zacchaeus doing here? Well, he's showing us a little bit of the cost of friendship because this moment ruins his reputation to an even greater degree. Again, no one is in awe at the desire of Zacchaeus that he's so desperate that he'll do anything. They're thinking, have you no dignity? You're already a traitor. You're already a thief. And now you're running, inevitably maybe pushing people, getting to this tree and then climbing it. Like, dude, dude, like where's your level of honor? And this is a shame and honor society. So here Zacchaeus is willing to pay a cost just for the hopes that he will see Jesus. And he's kind of putting everything on the line because at this point, if he doesn't make friends with Jesus, I mean, he is done for. Zacchaeus, the short tax collecting tree climber. (laughs) That's his new Instagram handle. (laughs) Like just at me at that. That's where you can find me. He's putting it all there. And the next verse, please, This is an incredible moment of grace that you and I have got to see. There is a miracle about to unfold. Verse five, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. I like to read scripture slowly as I read it in my own time and just visualize what moments may have been like, what it looked like, not go so fast through a verse. And here's Zacchaeus up in a tree, desperate to see Jesus. And here's Jesus who meets him at the tree. And I wonder how long they locked eyes before Jesus spoke. Zacchaeus is there in the tree. I mean, it's also comical. And Jesus is looking up at him and says such a beautiful phrase, Zacchaeus, he names him. Come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Notice the urgency in the voice of Jesus here a desire for friendship. I must, I must. This is interesting. In this culture, and I still think today a little bit, but in this culture, certainly, respectable people do not impose hospitality on another person. And again, today, I think that's just normal. Like, hey man, can I come over? That's just, I guess. (laughs) Like, what do I do with that now? (laughs) And Jesus is like, He's, I must come to your, he's not saying come to my house. He's saying, I must come to your house. Here's what he's doing. He is completely breaking the social norms of his culture. He's pushing them down. Like this is such, we have to understand, this is such a big statement for a Jewish man to make to another Jewish tax collector. I must stay at your house today. And I just wonder if the reason why Jesus invites himself into the home of Zacchaeus is because he knows culturally and socially, Zacchaeus is probably thinking, I could never have enough reputation to invite a rabbi over. That Zacchaeus would never dare think. All he wants to do is see him. He could be wondering, well, maybe I get a glimpse, but I could never share a meal. Because again, to share a meal at this time is to create a bond of friendship. And what if Jesus knows that Zacchaeus knows he could never invite Jesus in. And so Jesus initiates the friendship with Zacchaeus. 
that Jesus takes the first step towards invitation. Is this not a picture of the gospel? Yes, amen. Happening in a fig tree? Yeah. <laughs> How cool! I got a fig tree as a present this year from someone, and I am so excited for, um, for this, this new season, for me to just go out and see figs growing, and this reminder that even the fig tree is a representation of the gospel. That for Zacchaeus, every time he would see another fig tree, he would remember, ah, that's when Jesus initiated friendship with me. It's the gospel. Look at what we read in scripture, what the gospel is. It's not based on your initiation. It's based on the Father's. It's his grace. Zacchaeus, like you and I, have no merit to stand on to ever think that we could bring God near. And so God comes near to us. 1 John 4.10, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is love. Who initiates? The Father. He does. Romans 5.8, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us when? While we were still, what does it say? Sinners. Sinners. The gospel is the story that you and I are lost in our sin with no way to atone for it. And the father sees us in our lostness and sends his son to pay the price for us. That is the gospel message. It is a message of love and reconciliation initiated by a holy God. I just, believers, please grasp this or you will be, you'll be a proud Christian. And there's, there should be no such thing. We are humbled by this truth. Your salvation and mine is a free gift of God's grace. The Father moved first to reconcile you. And, and notice, what's the other word there? I must come to your house when? When was Jesus coming to Zacchaeus' house? Anyone remember? Today. Today, immediately, he says, get down. I'm going to your house today. I hope you got some chips, bro. I'm coming through. Put the pigs in a blanket on. Oh, they're Jewish. They can't eat that. Put, put some knishes in, man. We're we going to have a party. But give me my burger with no cheese. Like, we're going to have some good, good food. He's like, I'm coming to your house today. Don't miss the gravity of that statement. Jesus does not say, Zacchaeus, get out of that tree. Get right, and then I'll come over. Religion will say that to us. That if you want a relationship with a holy God, you better clean up your life. Some of you, if this is your first time in a church today, I hope that throughout this moment and this experience today in our service, that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you. You are welcomed here. That you didn't have to clean up at the door. And he tells Zacchaeus, it's a moment of grace. Come down now. I'm coming over now. He's still a tax collector. He's still a mess. And Jesus is drawing near. Friendship. And while Zacchaeus may have had to pay a price by climbing the tree, it is truly Jesus who will pay the ultimate price to be friends with Zacchaeus. Watch. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and they began to mutter. They got their phones out and I got something to say. I'm posting about, I'm posting about this. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Do you know that when you live like Jesus, you are always going to have people that mutter against your lifestyle? Now, if they're muttering because you're claiming to be a Christian and you're not living like one, that's different. We talked about that last week. But if you're loving like Jesus loves and being around people that others reject, there's going to be a community that's going to mutter about that. And if Blaze Church is your church, you better get used to it because we get muttered about all week long. (laughs) I get the emails. (laughs) Welcome people. Jesus welcomes him and the people began to mutter. Do you know why? Again, because to share a meal is to affirm friendship in this society. I read this one quote. I I love it. Table fellowship created bonds of friendship. 
to fellowship around a table was to form this bond of friendship. You didn't welcome someone into your home unless you welcomed them into your life. And so here it is that Jesus is humiliated by the crowd for welcoming Zacchaeus, for hosting, for sharing a meal. He is humiliated. He is, he is the one who is muttered about. Notice, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. They're not, they're not throwing shade on Zacchaeus. They're talking about Jesus. The crowd is mocking Jesus for how he's loving people. And you and I both know that this is not the last time the crowd will mock Jesus for how he loves people. That there will be a day where Jesus will be mocked by the crowds at his crucifixion. And people will not understand it. Why? Because God sent his son to this world to save and rescue sinners. And the crowd would mutter again on another day to say, how could he be friends with such sinners? And if you and I have been saved by his amazing grace, we say, thank you, God, that you are willing to be humiliated and endure shame and scorn so that we could be friends. Because he says the night before his crucifixion, crucifixion, I call you friends. I feel like busting out. Bro, can we bring in, I am a friend of God. I mean, can we just reprise with that maybe? Thank you. Don't follow. That is not a cue. They're texting each other like, pastor wants a new song. Do we? Have? Maybe in the 11. So now they're together. The desire for friendship, the cost of friendship. But now they're, we're going to see what does friendship actually do to Zacchaeus? Why does it matter to you and I? So look at the result in Zacchaeus's life. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Don't miss this. This is radical transformation. You just heard a story from Nina of how she has been transformed by Jesus through Blaze Church in small groups. Well, we are seeing Zacchaeus give his video story right now. He's just standing up and saying, you know what? Who I was before the friendship is not who I am anymore now that Jesus is in my life. And if I've cheated anybody, I'm giving it back. And I've never thought about the poor, but now I am. He's being transformed. And oh, what a shame that the crowd is missing it because they're too angry. They're missing stories of life change. Maybe because they don't possess philia. Yeah. Friendship love. Friendship love matters. We started off with the quote, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. There is an importance to our friendships. And here's what I want you to understand. If I can rabbit trail for just a minute and then we'll come back and close out Zacchaeus' moment. But for you and I to understand this, your friends matter greatly in your life. There is a result that your friends are making in your life and there's a result that you're bringing to the friendship. Let me say it this way. Friends either corrupt us or build us up. They never leave us unchanged. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. They will, your friends will not leave you unchanged. Yeah. And you won't leave them unchanged. They are either going to corrupt, tear down, draw you away from the heart of the Father, or they're going to build you up. It's just the reality. I, I can tell you don't believe me. It's okay. <laughs> you don't have to. Allow me to read scripture. Proverbs 13, 20. Walk with the wise and become wise. A companion of fools suffers harm. That would be great in a fortune cookie. <laughs> you would read that like, I don't even need this lunch. I got everything I need. No wonder my life is a wreck. I have a companion of fools. Proverbs 12, 26. The righteous choose their friends carefully but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Yeah. Choose your friends carefully. Good. How about this? 1 Corinthians 15, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's okay, pastor. Like, I've got this. I can spend all this time with these people and I'm the influence there. Are you sure? Are you sure? And this is not a call not to be friends with sinners and tax collectors because Jesus did. So please don't bubble up, Christians. 
I find I got to get rid of all my unsaved friends. No, who are you going to disciple? Who are you going to be missional to? So you got to understand the line here, though. At what point is your friend circle influencing you and pulling you away from the heart of the Father? And then at what point then are you coming alongside to bring light in the darkness? And that's what's so beautiful about the Holy Spirit. He gives us wisdom. But today's focus and today's purpose in this message is you have got to understand there may be people in your life that are not building you up, they're tearing you down. I love the way the the New Century Version puts it, the, the contemporary English. Verse 33 again, don't fool yourselves, bad friends will destroy you. Don't fool yourself, man. Come on, you and I have got to see this. And how do we take it from Zacchaeus? Well, it took one good friend for transformation to take place in his life. You and I have got to see. So there's a desire for friendship. There's a cost of friendship. You and I pay the cost to have friends all the time. You don't have friends where it doesn't cost you something. And that's okay. That's part of friendship. It costs you your time, your emotions, your energy, all of it. It's always costing you and I something to have friends. And we desire friends and it's costing us and there's a result. So here's the question to think through. Is the cost you're paying worth the result you're getting? Because you're paying a cost to have those people in your life. They're paying a cost to have you there. Is the result worth it? And for Zacchaeus, he, he saw the result, man. He, he experienced the result because Jesus was willing to show him brotherly affection. Philia. Please, church, how transformative would it be if this church was filled with people who had Philia? How many here, by a show of hands, has someone in their life who is not in this room who you would love for them to know Jesus and come to church with you at some point. Okay, so your friend comes, right? Aren't you hoping that this church is filled with people who have brotherly affection to welcome your friend? That we honor each other? That we love each other? Scripture tells us that is how we are to live, followers of Christ. Romans 12, 10. Love one another, and here's our word, with brotherly affection. And he expands on that and says, outdo one another in showing honor. How cool would it be if Blaze Church was filled with people who our only goal was to be more honorable than the person sitting next to us? I mean, that would be a fun place to be at. You know what? It's already here. Place church, this is your culture. This is crazy. This is going to blow your mind. I've heard of churches. It's crazy. I've heard of churches where people get upset if a kind greeter asks them to sit in a certain seat and row. I've heard of these churches where they walk in and say, are you kidding me? There's yellow chain. They're telling me I can't sit in this seat anymore. I've heard of churches where people get twisted over a seat. That's, how many, just celebrate that that's not Blaze Church. Come on, how awesome is that? Where we come in and say, bro, you want me in front row? I'm down. I normally sit here, but you're saying, here, you want some vision? Can I preach vision a, a little week before Vision Sunday? Do you know why? Because you just raised your hand and you have friends and we need to make more space for your friends. That's why we're doing this. We're not just here to make you upset when you walk through the curtain. We gave a little more thought and prayer than that. We're thinking about we need more space. We're running out of seats in this space, guys. Okay, you prayed for this. So it's happening. So we're like, okay, well, we need to move in a little bit. And you know what else? Here's, don't you feel like a culture of unity right now? We're all together. And I love it. So thank you for carrying philia in the tiniest of things, a seat. And so that way, when bigger moments come, because Matthew 18 says that we're going to offend each other. Jesus says, and when you are offended, go to the person in philia and seek forgiveness. So if I see some of you giving Dave a hug on the way out today, I know why. (laughs) I'm so sorry, bro. 
pedophilia. <laughs> it was just a seat. I know. Let's see how it ends with Zacchaeus. And Jesus said to him, this is crazy. Today, salvation has come to this house. Salvation. The friendship of Jesus ushered in salvation to a tax collector. Since he also is a son of Abraham, for the son of man came to seek and to save who? The lost. The lost. Jesus uses a strong word here. He says salvation has come to this house. What did Zacchaeus do to deserve the salvation that Jesus brought? Nothing. You know what he did? The only thing he did was this. He received it. He said yes to the invitation that Jesus made to him. Scripture tells us that God calls out to us. And if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised Christ from the dead, we are saved. You and I respond to an invitation of a holy God. Because Zacchaeus could have stayed up in that tree. Zacchaeus could have said, no way, Lord, not my house. I'm too messed up. Or God, that's great. I'm, I'm just working on some things. I've got everyone's tax paperwork all over the kitchen table. Not today. <laughs> it's just not. He could have had any excuse. And he welcomes him gladly. In just a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to welcome gladly Jesus into your life. That you are going to say, I want to know who he is. When Jesus, you just got to see this because it's just so shocking. When Jesus says, for he too is a son of Abraham, the crowd would have lost their mind. In two ways. One, Jesus is acknowledging that this traitor is a fellow Jew by calling him a son of Abraham. And they've already discounted him as, no, he's not. And Jesus says, he is a son of Abraham. He's affirming that heritage. But here's the second shock. He's admitting that sons of Abraham can be lost. Something Jewish people would never believe in this culture. When he says he too is a son of Abraham and the son of man came to seek and save the lost, they connect the dots instantly. And they go, excuse me, Jewish people are not lost. Romans are lost. Gentiles are lost. That tax collector is lost. And Jesus is saying, your heritage neither qualifies you nor disqualifies you. You are neither good enough nor too far gone for the gospel to reach your heart. Yes. For Jesus to come into your life. So Jesus expresses philia. And it changes a man. Next week is Small Group Sunday. Who's excited for it? Who's excited for the pancakes? Next week, you will have opportunity to sign up to express philia to a group of other people. Can I frame it that way for you this morning? It might be something you've never thought of. Our small groups exist and have three values. You've heard these before. To connect, protect, and grow with people. To connect with others relationally, to build friendships with other people. We're in rows right now, but you and I have got to be in circles where we can lock eyes and meet people and be vulnerable and share. And maybe not with the whole group, but with somebody. We connect. We protect one another, which means when you begin to share what's going on in your life with someone else, they carry that burden with you. They love you. And we grow together, connecting protecting and growing. I want to frame it this way because you may be thinking, yeah, but I just cannot make that happen. I can't be a part of a group for your sake. But what about for the other person? What about the person who needs you there to show philia to them? Could there be a person that by you joining a group is going to experience transformation during those 10 weeks simply because you were there and you were a friend. Don't diminish friendship. There's an importance to it. There's a value to it. And I'm so excited to be in a small group for 10 weeks and to have brotherly affection shown to me and to have the opportunity to show Philia to others. And so I want us to pray now. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads as a moment of prayer, posture of prayer. 
And I want to pray specifically for those of you who this hits home because as we started off saying, making friends is hard. And maybe you feel alone today. You feel isolated. You've been hurt before. I mean, I will not diminish your experiences. You've been betrayed. You've let people in. You've revealed. And now you are embracing that narrative of conceal. Don't feel. Don't let them know. Don't let anyone in. And I just want to pray that the God who comforts and the God who heals would begin a healing work in you this morning. If you're saying, Pastor Keith, I just need health in my relationships and friendships. Would you raise your hand with me right now? Don't be, bo- don't be afraid. Just raise your hand. It's a sign of surrender. Yeah. I'm saying, God, I just need help in my friendships. They're rough. It's hard. I feel alone sometimes. God, just just work in me right now. God, you see these hands that are going up in the honesty and the vulnerability of the moment before you saying, God, I need help. We know that isolation is not good. We know that the enemy wants us segregated. And there are honest people now saying, help me, Jesus. God, would you begin to heal the wounds that are still open? Would trust be built up once again? May true friendships begin to form. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. You can lower your hand. Look at me for just a moment. The same invitation that Jesus made to Zacchaeus, he makes to each one of us today. Scripture says, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised Christ from the dead, you and I will be saved. For it's with your heart you believe and you are justified. And it's with your mouth you profess your faith. In just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to make a bold profession of faith to say, I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I want him to be my friend today. I want him to be my savior today. I don't want to live life alone any longer, but rather I want to know the God who I was made to know. And so in just a moment as a church, we are going to profess with our mouth. And I'm going to invite you that if you have never put your faith in Jesus, that in this moment, you would raise your hand as a sign of surrender to say, God, rescue me, save me, forgive me of my sins. Church, let's say this prayer together. And if you want to know Jesus, say, just lift up your hand. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus died and rose again so I could be forgiven. Thank you for new life. Today, I give you mine. Thank you for making me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, celebrate with all of heaven that's saying there are people who are lost that are now found.